Welcome to another edition of Inside the War Room. Returning guest, the man, the myth, the energy guru himself, the humble doctor, Dr. Anas Alahaji. Uh, Anas, how's it going today, sir? Thank you very much. Everything is going very well. Yeah, it's a. Uh... Of course, it's unfortunate that Big Oren is, did not accept the invitation, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, otherwise, everything is well. Oh, Big Oren didn't even acknowledge the invitation. So we'll have to give him a hard time about that on uh twitter so okay anas let's get into it uh first thanks for coming on on short notice i reached out yesterday and you were so gracious with your time all right so we have a lot going on um maybe just do this let's set the scene we're recording this on june 25th 2021 set the scene on where we've been in the oil market the economic market for the past six months almost seven months now maybe some things that surprised you some things that haven't surprised you um but kind of recap the first half of the year as far as the oil markets are concerned. Generally speaking, everyone was expecting a recovery, uh, or at least to say most people were expecting a recovery. Uh, and I say this because, you know, there are certain people who kind of uh, went into the doomsday scenario and we will never recover and that's it for the economy, that's it for oil, etc. So let's say most people basically were expecting a recovery most people expected that OPEC plus uh, will continue its compliance. So you put those two together, we did not see any surprises. The biggest surprise for me basically was the price range was higher than what I expected at the, at the, at the first half of the year. Uh, whatever prices we see today and we saw in the last two, three months, I was expecting that in the second half. So the prices came in early in this case and that was the biggest uh, surprise but between the recovery of demand and the opec uh, plus uh, compliance uh, of course under restraint of shale uh, everything was going in the right uh, direction and the expected direction okay so you talk about the prices um, generally apart from oil we're always talking about inflation 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 whether it's uh, lumber or meat or whatever how much is inflation impacting oil prices right now well, and real quick before we answer that, break down if it is impacting them, how is it impacting them? Because sometimes we just say inflation, but we don't understand exactly how that works. Okay, I'm going to take my time here explaining these issues because these issues are very important. Some of them are economics 101, but it's very important for everyone to hear. When we talk about oil prices causing inflation, we have to remember that we are talking about a vicious cycle. What that means is, inflation leads to higher oil prices, higher oil prices lead to inflation, and then the cycle goes on. The problem is that with this cycle, because the oil producing countries in the Gulf link their currencies to the dollar, and the dollar uh, is used to price oil, we end up with a serious problem. Because with inflation, the real value of their exports decline. So the value of every exported barrel of oil declines in this case. So what we are going to see uh, as a result of this vicious cycle that what oil, nominal oil prices might increase, but real oil prices that are received by those countries did not improve much. So don't expect that much improvement just on the higher nominal uh, uh, price. The, the whole literature about the relationship between oil prices, inflation, and economic growth in the consuming countries is not only weak, most of it is flawed. And the reason why, if you take even the, the most praised uh, academic papers in the field about how oil causes negative economic growth or slows economic growth, you take oil from those equations and substitute that with higher interest rate or decline in government revenues, you get the same results. That shows you how flawed the literature is on this. Higher oil prices on their own do not cause inflation. Higher oil prices on their own do not cause negative economic growth or slow economic growth. If you look at the period between 2004 and 2008, oil prices jumped 50, 60, 70, 80, 140, 147, we did not see any impact on, uh, on inflation or on economic growth. Economies in Europe, United States, China, India, 
we're growing like crazy. So where are those theories that were born in the 70s and all those papers that's been talking about this? Where did that impact? Well, the reason what, what, what they failed was the following. What really affect the economy are the macroeconomic variables. And here we talk about government expenditures. We talk about military expenditures. We talk about changes in taxation. We talk about interest rates. We talk about the value of the dollar. So if, if oil prices are rising and governments are afraid that they are, they are going to cause uh, inflation, unemployment, et cetera, like people believe, governments have enough tools to combat that. And that's what they did because after September 11th in 2001, what we've seen is we've seen massive expenditures on security on one side and military on the other. We had two wars. So expenditures basically increased substantially. And because they were afraid that's going to affect the economy, we've seen massive increase in government expended, the normal government expenditures. At the same time, interest rate was going down. The dollar value was going down. That was during the George Bush era where taxes went down. Those variables, basically, the impact of them on the economy were so huge that even a price of 140 did not impact the economy. The same thing for India, the same thing for China. We, even in 2011, 2012, prices at $100, when we reached $100 in 2012, 2013, did not affect those economies. So we have a complete kind of general misunderstanding of how oil prices affect the economy and therefore how they affect inflation and how they affect the, uh, the overall uh, economic growth. So the problem we have, just a final point. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. A final point, uh, the, some of the impact of inflation comes through the dollar devaluation, because what is inflation? Inflation, when prices goes up, that means the money value goes down. So the dollar goes down. That's where the largest impact comes from inflation on oil. It's through the currency, because oil is priced in dollar. And therefore, some people believe we have this constant inverse relationship between the dollar value and oil prices. So if the dollar value goes down, then oil prices should instantly goes up. That's absolutely not correct. And there is no economic theory to support it. Uh, what happened is in 2000, the, during the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, uh, people pulled their money out of the financial markets, out of the stock market, et cetera. They were scared. They want to take to put it in some safe place. Usually the safe place is real estate. But we know the collapse happened because of real estate. So they have to go to commodities. And that's where some people felt that there is this relationship between the decline in the dollar and the higher, and, and the higher price. Because people were running away from the dollar. They were running away from real estate or running away from the stock market. So later on, when they programmed the computers, they programmed them based on this idea. So we made it happen because we wanted to. But in reality, we have a lot of evidence to show that neither in theory nor in numbers, uh, empirical studies basically, to show that this relationship exists. But it does exist in the medium term and the long term. And that is very important because with lower dollar, we end up with the following situation. Now the Chinese can buy more with the same amount of, of yuans they have. In fact, I've written in, uh, I think it was in 2006, uh, I, I've written an article saying that revaluation uh, of the yuan is going to lead to uh, um, a crisis in the oil market and unprecedented prices. And it happened because the dollar went down and the Chinese can buy more with the same amount of money. The same thing for everyone else in Europe and other places. And there are many charts that I put out on, on the web and several presentations where it shows the difference between oil priced in dollar versus other currencies. Oil was cheap, although at 100, 140 was cheap for some of those countries because of the differences in currencies. Just imagine mm -hmm. the euro being at 170, a dollar 70 uh, instead of a dollar 10. And you can see how the difference will be in, in oil in this case. So quantity demanded in this case will go up because of that. The second one, the second point is 
the oil producing countries are getting less real value because what oil producing countries do they they export that oil and with that money they import stuff but if they import from china they import from europe then they are losing money because their currencies went up but all the money they are getting are in dollars so a barrel of oil can buy less and therefore they don't have enough money to expand investment on extra capacity or maintenance or everything else and therefore supply decreases in this case so it happens in the medium term long term but not in the short term so the bottom line of this is the impact of inflation on oil is mostly through the the uh, exchange rates not directly from uh, the market okay so back to let's take the first part when i was going to interject here um if i understand what you're saying you're saying that if you just to use a, a very simple analogy um if you have a person in person a has um, a 10 million dollars in his bank account and he's paying a dollar for gasoline and gasoline shoots up to five dollars um, generally speaking, unless he's buying exponentially amount of gasoline, the inflation is not going to impact how he's handling the economy because he has cash, he has the ability to be liquid, he has the ability to do something. However, if you have someone who is tight on cash, you're making $10 an hour and the price shoots up, their ability to withstand that is, is a lot less. And so we look at these governments and how governments are responding. If the governments aren't allowing for things to um, react to the higher prices, you would have. Um, so if the governments don't respond a certain way, the, 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 in the higher oil prices would impact the economy uh, this way. If they, if they respond a different way, so it would impact it differently. So more or less, you were saying it seemed like that um, the government's response and how they've handled these things is how we should view the inflation. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So in a sense, the, the, and we had evidence historically to show how the government made it worse. And that happened in the United States alone. We have at least seven, eight instances where the government made it worse. And we have other instances, probably two of them uh, that I cited in my work where uh, they did a good job, although probably it did not happen by in intentionally, probably mm -hmm. it happened by coincidence. But to go back to your assumption about the person who has money and higher gasoline prices, et cetera, we learned a few things here because the, 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 this is important. If you ask, and, and many writers basically fell into this trap. They say there is no substitute for gasoline because the, your car takes gasoline and that's it. That's the, how they view it. Mm. No, that's not correct because walking is a substitute for gasoline. Right. A bike is a substitute for gasoline. Public transportation is a substitute from gasoline. Now, as we speak, working from home is a substitute for gasoline. Mm -hmm. So there are many substitutes. It's not like, in, they say it's inelastic. No, that's not correct. That's a kind of a, the way they look at it, kind of very, very narrow definition of what it is. Mm -hmm. On the other side, many of the uh, articles, even academic articles, forgot the role of saving and wealth in this case, because they keep looking at income. Yes, my right. income could be limited, but look, if I have saving, I can use the saving to that's spend right. on extra gasoline. If my stock uh, stock portfolio is going up, I can just cash some and use it. And that's basically what, what we've seen. Uh, if you recall, there were many articles, oh, you are too young even to recall that, 2007, 2008, uh, where people basically uh, started spending money because the stock market was doing very well and, and they have the extra money to, uh, uh, to spend. That's the wealth effect. Mm -hmm. So many of those studies and many of those articles ignored the saving and they ignored the wealth effect. As we speak today, it seems that the saving levels, because people are afraid, is very high, which means that once everything normalizes, we are going to see additional spending not coming from income, that will be coming from saving. Yeah, well, the, okay, you're saying the savings is high, but the, with the low interest rates, do you think the savings are high? Because low interest rates don't incentivize saving. Well, the, the, the issue here is just like the uh, uh, oil demand trap that we talked about it in the last show that these things are not related to price or income. Okay. These, these things are related to fear. They are related to, mm -hmm. I'm going to lose my job tomorrow. They're related to, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, just like the people who are buying guns. Right. So, so to, to go back to like the gasoline analogy, you say we, gasoline can't be replaced. And so people would say, well, Mark, um, you know, low interest rates don't incentivize savings. And what you're saying is, well, you can't look at it like that. You got to look at it like, well, people are looking, you know, they might have to move, they might be sick. And so they're, they're saving despite the fact the market signals 
from an economic standpoint, aren't telling them to do that. So they're, they're using a different way to think about saving. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, one thing that we've heard, uh, and this came in from one of the questions that we got, was super cycle. So what is a super cycle? Um, how does it pertain to oil? And what are your thoughts? That was kind of a big narrative a month or two ago. I haven't really heard a lot of that lately. Uh, do we miss the super cycle? So kind of take a I, I am glad you, you linked the two together because they are linked. Uh, and the idea here is very simple. To have a super cycle, there are conditions. And I'm not going to go over those conditions. I'm going to mention just a few here. Uh, if you look at the previous super cycle, we had the rebirth of China. Okay, where you go from no roads to like unbelievable infrastructure. I mean, a couple of towers to thousands of towers. I'm talking about building and housing and etc. So you have this massive, you have a whole country with massive population, massive growth that contributed to that. Add to it all the spending that we have, whether the military spending, the security spending, the taxes, the interest rate, the dollar, etc. All of that together contributed to that uh, 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 super cycle with the idea, and we always have to think about this in a very positive way. Uh, energy in general, energy in general was readily available with access capacity. We ended up with lower access capacity later in the cycle when we reached 2007, 2008, that's when we had the wall. But during that time, we have a lot of extra capacity in every single energy source we have. So with, with, with that, it is very clear that while people are talking about the super cycle now, we got to question, okay, which, China is almost done on the basics. So they are almost, their growth is going to be in the range of four to 6%, which is similar to any advanced country that has kind of a population migration. Uh, uh, so which one is the next one? India, I don't think so. Uh, India has too many problems to follow the steps of China. Will we see growth? Yes, but it's not the enough, gro enough growth to lead to that super cycle. Then you look at government spending uh, and what we are seeing in terms of government spending, the, the, the uh, interest rate, taxation, et cetera, it seems everything is going in the opposite dire direction where we are going to see after COVID, we are going to see some cut in government spending. Uh, those stimulus packages are going to stop. Taxes are going to go up. And anyone who thinks that uh, Biden presidency is going to end up with the same taxes that we have today, they, they don't know what we, we, So we are going to end up with all the factors that's going to destroy a super cycle. So I don't think we are going to end up with a super cycle. The reason why we are seeing this spike in commodities simply because in 2020, we've seen massive decline in investment throughout in every single commodity. And people just walked out and some people died even on the job. So it was that lack of investment that's leading to the super spike. Now we have the recovery. On top of this recovery, we have this wave uh, because of climate change policies, we have this wave on renewable energy that requires certain minerals and certain metals and certain things. So you put that on top of it and you can see where the causes are. So it's not a super cycle as much as there are really some fundamental issues leading to what we see today. I think this is going to be relatively short lived. Uh, it's not going to last for long. Okay. So let's talk, you brought up China and you know, where the next thing is. And so this, I haven't seen a lot of attention being brought to this topic. Um, the China watchers observed that China announced a three child policy here recently. Um, but if you look at Europe, the U S if you take our immigration and especially uh, China, large portions of the world are not above replacement level. Um, and I think the population is ex globally expected to peak in 2070, apart from sub-Saharan Africa, which seems to be pretty well above it. Um, from an economic standpoint, unless you have huge advancements in technology, things become more expensive over time. Is, is that a concern for the oil and gas industry that maybe we um, will make things more more expensive, <laughs> you know, just because we're going to have less people in the future? Uh, do you think of that in some of your, your, your projections for long-term energy use? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? A couple of points here to mention. First of all, 
uh, I think it is a mistake to focus on, on, on population growth. If you go back and study the relationship between energy demand and what causes uh, the increase in energy demand, it's really the urbanization. So you might end up with doubling the population in the, in the villages that have no power and it has no impact. Mm. They just burn more wood, basically. That's what it is. So it's urbanization. It's China's urbanization. Those mega cities in China and India and other places, it's that urbanization. And, and one of the reasons why, because if you bring someone from a forest or a small village with no power and no running water, no even restrooms, and you put them in an apartment in the city with running water, electricity, and restrooms, even if they don't have a job, they, ha they are not going to go back. That's it. They are not going to go back. So you bring a lot of people, their energy consumption is going to go up regardless of income, which means that if their income becomes zero, they are not going to go back. So there is kind of like this backstop where things just stop. You cannot go back in it. So the idea that with lower population growth, we are going to see lower energy consumption, that of concern, probably we got to look at it from urbanization point of view. And from urbanization point of view, whether you have two children, or all of us, you know, fathers, and we know this, whether you have two children or three children, your energy consumption is almost the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. This matters when? Matters when they grow up, and we have this situation in Iran today. Okay, when you have this massive growth in birth rate and all of a sudden those kids get married now and everyone wants his own apartment <laughs> and everyone wants his own car. What's a job? That's where the situation, absolutely. And that's where the situation hits at that time that, that you, you need the expansion. So it's, a, the, or, it's kind of uh, organic growth of the urban centers when you have that growth in population. On the other side, in my presentations, I always focused on why OPEC and the IEA was wrong on European um, oil demand and energy demand in general. And one of them is no one is counting the impact of the massive migration from Africa to Europe. Yeah, that, it, that, that, that without that, the European demographic numbers will look far worse than what they do. Absolutely. So what we are seeing basically is, and, and we are talking about tens of millions of people. We are not talking about small number. And those people are coming from areas with mostly no electricity, no power. So they are net addition to the system, to the global system of demand for energy when right. they migrate to those countries. And this brings us to the climate change issues because the climate change pundits they say, well, look, we are going to see if, if we continue like this, many areas will be flooded and they will have droughts and this stuff. And we are going to see migration from those poor areas to the rich areas and this, 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 et cetera. Well, using the same argument, basically, we are seeing now that we might end up exactly with the opposite situation that migration will happen because of the policies of climate change. Right. Well, uh, so unpack that real quick, why, why that might be the case so people understand why you would say that, because it's, it's counterintuitive to the larger narrative, but if someone goes, huh, okay, how does that work? So un unpack well, if, let's look at countries like Guyana today, okay, they just found oil and they became a major oil producer and we are telling them you got to stop, okay? Those guys, one of the poorest countries in the world, and you are telling them, oh, by the way, no, 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 you got to stop. You go to Nigeria and tell them they got to stop. You go to Congo and tell them they got to stop. Okay, well, if they stop, guess what? They're going to migrate to your country. That's right. And, and what bothered me about these things is that any child in those countries, when they watch TV, they want exactly what your children have and what my children have. And to think they are a lesser people in terms of their uh, ambitions and what they are driving for and what they want, this is an insult to humanity, an insult to those people. And Agreed. it's literally pure discrimination. Yes. So... Those policies, if you keep forcing those policies, and here is why, because even the idea that the oil producers will benefit from climate change policies because we still need oil and oil prices will go up and they make more money, this is a very weak argument. And the reason why 
they are being affected neg negatively by those policies, just like anyone else. Yes, they might make some extra money because of higher oil prices, but that's it. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, the ambition in Saudi Arabia was to list Aramco in all major markets, including in New York and London. Now with what we've seen with ExxonMobil, what we've seen with Chevron, what we've seen with Shell, et cetera, and then you add the ESG to it, guess what? They are not going to list anymore. And those companies that, let's say in Kuwait or UAE and, or, or others, that want to go to do the IPO and we're planning on IPO just like Aramco, they are not going to do it anymore. So that's negative. So they are already being affected, affected negatively. Those companies, the national oil companies borrow money, okay? And if we tighten the screws on banks and tell them you cannot lend to uh, uh, oil producers and oil companies, those companies have to pay very high interest rate to be able to borrow. And if they don't borrow, they cannot deliver. And those investors who are already involved in the pipelines in the UAE and Saudi Arabia and other places, basically, their board, the board uh, of, of their companies might ask them just to relinquish those and, and leave. So the impact on those oil producers is severe too. And they, are, they will suffer from those policies too. The problem is those, we are not going to be able to reduce our demand on oil meaningfully. Mm -hmm. And therefore, by the time supply decreases, demand is not going to decrease enough. And therefore, we are going to have a major energy crisis and everyone will be uh, screaming and yelling and blaming oil producers for not investing enough. And believe me, this is going to happen because it happened before. So let me ask you this. Would it be helpful to think about it like this? If you look at per capita uh, oil usage, and so I think um, the U.S. is 20 or 21st, but that's only because the top 20 are very small islands. Um, so everyone beneath us is a, is a normal country um, that has usage. And if you go look at some of those countries that you listed and you look at how much oil usage that their average citizen is using, and then look at how much our average citizen is using, you know, Anas, Ryan, the listener, um, and then try to project a world where they have the same standard of living that we do, you begin to see the problem, which is um, if you take those numbers and figure out the difference between where we're at and where they're at, they have a long way to go. And there is no path right now for them to get to the same per capita usage as we have um, with current technology without using oil. That's absolutely the point. And I do have one chart to go back, I think, to uh, early 19th century to show where China stands relative to uh, United States and Europe and everyone else. And despite all the development in China, by the way, yeah. they are still like in the first quartile. Yeah. It's like the US in 1950 or something yeah, like that. Totally I forgot what was the... So you are absolutely correct on that. And that's why uh, uh, the argument I made about uh, climate change, current climate change policies are not compatible with the human rights. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and Ellen and I talk about this on Energy Week quite often, which is, you know, these policies are very much discriminatory to emerging markets that can't afford them. And, and, and just, I'll take one quick shot here at the global elite. This global 10% tax that they're willing to implement is the same thing, right? Because you're going to penalize a country, um, theoretically, who is trying to attract companies to come work there by raising the tax level uh, to try to make your country more competitive and your country already has a higher standard of living. So I think that kind of falls under the same umbrella. Well, uh, at the same time, we are going to end up with uh, another uh, problem. Uh, one of my colleagues basically is working on this and writing, uh, doing some writing on it. Uh, what the end result of this is, you are just forcing the companies with uh, high, with assets with high emissions, mm -hmm. basically to just either create subsidiaries and, and, and just dump all those assets on them and have those subsidiaries move somewhere else or just sell them to those who cannot afford to deal with them or who do not have the moral standards uh, basically right. to deal with them in an effective way. So the unintended consequences of those policies are really scary when you start thinking about it. I mean, the major problem we have around the world in every single country, that including the United States, is corruption. And to think that we are not going to see corruption because of these policies, that means really the person does not know what reality is. The fact is, because of those policies, those bad, let's call them bad assets, they are going to move to other countries where they can cook the books, they can cook the numbers, they can do whatever uh, in this case and show that everything is 
uh, everything is fine and, mm -hmm. and glorious. Uh, while we, uh, uh, we don't see any change in climate change uh, and, and we don't see reduction uh, globally, I'm talking, we don't see that much reduction in global emissions. Well, it, it, and a simple analogy here is um, it's, it's a more complex situation, as you know, but you have the U.S., which sanctions Iranian oil, and then the Iranians go and sell it on the black market to China, and then the U.S. is mad at China for how China operates globally. It's like, well, you push the Iranians to sell discounted oil because on the black market to the Chinese, the Chinese have huge oil demand problems. What do you think they're going to do? Not everyone is going to play the game the way that you want them to play it. They're going to play it to suit their best interest. And so um, you see this already, and it's a little frustrating that we kind of live in this um, pretend land where we think, well, we're going to walk this policy and everyone's going to follow it. Follow it. No, that's not how it is. So I, I, I agree. The other thing I would ask real quick is, do you think that you will see emerging markets actually go the opposite way, like El Salvador with Bitcoin and say, you know what? We've tried these big programs before. We're going to go do our own thing. If you come here, we're going to really deregulate. Uh, one of the problems I have with such things is that all of these are one man show. And if that man goes, then the, sh the whole show goes with it. <laughs> yes. You're talking, about, uh, you're talking about the leaders in the countries. Yes. Correct. So yeah. that, that's, that's a big uh, problem. Uh, but let me kind of focus on the previous idea that we are talking about. I'm going to mention a personal story because I think the audience would love personal stories. Uh, I got audited once by the IRS for not reporting uh, $800, which was a research grant. And they said this was not classified as a grant. That was classified as salary. And therefore, you have to pay $125 or something like this on it. And I was kind of calling them on the phone and say, you know, we used to have those old phones, not, not the cell phones and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, on the old phone, telling them, look, here is the paperwork. Here's this, this, this. This is really what the grant and this stuff. They, they want to force me to pay $125. So I told the guy, the, the IRS guy, I said, look, I am really angry. Okay. Because yesterday, President Clinton burdened Michael Rich, okay, for uh, not paying $40 million right. in taxes. And you guys are following me for 125. And the guy laughed. And he said, look, you know, I'm just an employee. I have to do my job, but I agree with you. <laughs> so the idea here is, if you have someone like Michael Rich basically cheating on their taxes, and a president who is burdening someone like this, and to expect people not going to cheat on climate change policies and CO2 and this stuff, that's naive. Absolutely naive. And I will give someone a, uh, I'll, I'll throw a reference here, John Bolton's book on the Trump administration, uh, whether you like that or not, it's, it's, uh, secondary. But in the book, he talks about one of his frustrations was, uh, we have these treaties and I, it's, it's not the IMF, it's the one with inter, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, I can't think of the name of it. Anyways, and he talks about how in the U.S. we have all these lawyers who are always trying to argue whether or not we're in compliance. And the Russians just go do whatever the Russians do. And so he was just bemoaning the fact that here the U.S. is trying, it, and this is Bolton's point, was trying to uphold these, these this treaty and the Russians aren't. And we're like suing ourselves basically to stop doing this. And so you get these weird things when you look at it, to your point. Uh, with rich or whatever when you look at any of this stuff um, and you see this in the middle east as well where you have two countries who are at each other's throats and then they'll send a tanker to tanker and do kind of a, a black market deal to transport oil or goods or whatever and yet they come out the next day and they're, they're at each other's throat at the press conferences so there's so much there's so much um corruption a but propaganda out there it's really hard to kind of cut through what's what absolutely absolutely Okay, so let's move on now. Um, you mentioned Iran real quick. Where are they at? I know your stance for some time has been that the Iranians would aren't necessarily dying to get back in bed with the U.S. You know, if they, if it works out for them, that's great. If it doesn't, they're fine. Don't, they're willing to take the hit. They've worked around it already. Um, where where what's the state of Iran right now? Um, do you uh, do you think that they are pretty pleased with their deal with China? Do you think China will be loyal to them in the long term? I know some people. Will, aren't necessarily confident in that. Uh, are the Iranians losing sleep at night over the Chinese deal? Uh, let me kind of uh, illustrate one point here. Uh, the, the, we have a problem in Iran because uh, one group that is part of the regime that controls all the oil trade. Mm -hmm. 
and all the smuggling and whatever secondary smuggling that takes place with the help of neighboring countries, with the help of some global mafia. And since those guys are in control, they are not really happy with sanctions because all of a sudden they start losing money and with the loss of money, they lose position. So it's not necessarily the whole country or the whole regime, it's really the influential part of the regime that is making a lot of money out of sanctions. That's why several countries, including Syria, for example, or Venezuela, they are not dying to, I mean, people are dying in those countries, but the regime itself is not dying to get out of sanctions because the amount of money they make is unbelievable in terms of smuggling, in terms of whatever they, they do. Mm -hmm. Everything you can imagine is the price is multiples of what in the United States. I mean, imagine someone in Venezuela or in Syria basically asking you to send them an iPhone because an iPhone in the United States is cheaper than iPhone in those countries. Right. Okay. Why? Because there are those who control everything and they are making a lot of money. So those influential elements of the regime have no interest in a deal. But sometimes they kind of cut their deals inside the regime itself on how to work it out and do other things. So to think that the regime itself is going to solve all the smuggling problems after reaching an agreement with Biden, it's not. I think the smuggling is going to continue because those elements still make money uh, that way. And you see this with like Mexico or Nigeria, countries who have a lot of oil theft. Um, you're like, why don't they stop it? Well, they don't stop it because someone's getting paid on the deal. So this is common. Absolutely. Absolutely. Otherwise, you are going to see people with clashing coves just fighting in the streets. Right. And, and, and you are absolutely correct because we've seen uh, uh, some of the uh, fighters even in Nigeria uh, get angry over the siege of a small uh, boat not over the occupation of their country or occupation of the part of the country or whatever, et cetera. It was over uh, the, the flow of, of money yeah. uh, in this case. Okay, uh, let's go to a couple of things. And we have some questions we took from Twitter. First off, um, let's talk about storage. Where, how much storage do we have? <laughs> like, do we have too much? Do we have not enough? Is the price relatively close to where the storage should be? Uh, there are- close to the storage? Okay. Uh, whether on Twitter or in other places, those there are bullish people who, who believe that oil prices will go to 100 and above 100, and they are pushing a narrative. And all their analysis is based on the change in storage. Okay. And that's not the way we analyze. That's not the way we model the market. Mm -hmm. We model the market basically based on supply and demand. And even those who tried, they look at it in a very static way. We don't do that. What we do is we look at the market supply and demand in a very dynamic way and how it's going to react in a sense every single minute. If you do that, there is no way you can see that there is a very bullish case. Are we bullish? Yes. But there is no, this idea, $130 that someone mentioned the other day, et cetera. They are based on supply and demand and all those uh, basic principles uh, there is no case for it. They are looking just at the change in storage. Here, they bring the five-year average. Look, the five-year average has no meaning. Uh, someone talked about it in a report a few years ago, and one oil minister liked it, and he mentioned it in a speech, and all of a sudden, start appearing on all kinds of reports. Has no value in economics, has no value in the oil market, but it has a value if you want to make it. If you program your computers, by saying, well, if we approach this level, then we have to buy more, then yes, it's, it is going to have an impact. Right, but, uh, uh, real, real quick on the five years. So um, on the five year storage level, one of the things I've wondered about is if we build more storage, right? Or if we had less, I'm talking about not it's full, but we had the capacity for more storage, um, that would influence where the five year average is by itself, right? And so if you're building a bunch of storage, um, or you're putting in tanker, uh, uh, tankers or whatever, that would influence how, how we view storage. And I don't you know a lot of people talk about that angle. Yeah, well, basically, once you talk about it, if you wanted to go that far, then we have to talk about the new built-in pipelines. Right. Okay, which we built so many pipelines and right. there is a lot of oil in them. Yes. And what, you have to exclude that 
from it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to find out where the equilibrium is. And then if we build the two new tankers, then you start talking about uh, exactly. tankers on sea and all this stuff. But it has that that thing has no value. There are other measurements we look at besides the five-year average. So if you look at it from a balance of supply and demand, and that brings us to the tweet that uh, uh, basically I have it pinned uh, on, on my Twitter account on the uh, sweet spot. Uh, if you do the modeling and you look at those details, US oil storage is still about 50 million barrels above the equilibrium needed for a stable market. 50 million. Now, if we get that by the end of the summer, then definitely 2022 is going to be bullish. Mm -hmm. Bullish okay. meaning higher than we are now? It means that this range of prices that we have and higher is possible. We're, this idea of going back to 40 and this stuff is not going to happen. Okay, so real quick. So we got 50 million barrels. If we add 50 million barrels of storage by the end of summer. Not add, take out. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Reduce so take it. Out, yes, we take out 50 million barrels by the end of August, roughly, we'll say. Um, next year, the prices will be here or higher. If we don't, the prices will be where? Lower. Lower. 50s. No, lower. 50s. In the 50s. Yes, yeah. in the 50s. In the 50s. So, so that's one point. The other point is people mis kind of misunderstand it the, it the following. We have the SPR in the United States. As you know, we have about 600 million barrels. Now the Biden administration is talking about getting rid of 100, 200 million of, out of that, mm -hmm. which could be almost 800,000 barrels a day for a year or more. Uh, China has storage that we don't know really the exact numbers, but they can dump on the market and they are already dumping. They've been dumping for the last three months. So they can cap uh, prices. And then if for some reason, let's say we have a hurricane that destroyed some capacity in the Gulf of Mexico, that will give the Biden administration and the International Energy Agency a reason to uh, use the strategic petroleum reserve because they need an emergency to use it. They mm -hmm. cannot use it for pricing. But any hurricane that causes some damage will give the Biden administration an excuse to use the SPR. The normal number they usually use is 30 million barrels. And that's a lot of oil right. in a short period of time. Uh, so, you, And then we have to add the what we call the effective spare capacity uh, in uh, OPEC members. Now, the effective spare capacity should be included, should be counted as uh, storage, should be counted as inventories. And the reason why, because it will take them uh, from one day to 90 days to bring online at least, at least four or five million barrels a day easily. Mm -hmm. So, you add those four or five million in addition to the story about the SPR and everything else, uh, you can see this idea of 100, 130 is not there. And even if we hit high number for some reason, it is not sustainable. It's not sustainable. And we have to remember uh, the, the reaction of demand in this case. If you go back to 2007, all of a sudden, despite all the positive factors in the economy, despite the higher income, despite higher government spending, et cetera, et cetera, we found a major decline in, in gasoline demand because gasoline prices reached $4. I used to have uh, uh, to, to follow this, and then I stopped probably over a year and a half ago. I used to post a number on the threshold for gasoline where people start changing their behavior. Mm -hmm. I think the yeah. last number I, I posted was $3.85. After that, they start looking for substitutes, including public transportation. The problem is after COVID, how the reaction will be on the use of public transportation and carpooling. That remains to be seen, whether we are going to see a reaction to $4 gasoline mm -hmm. uh, on the increase in ridership, public ridership because of that. And, and, and we, I don't know uh, really what, how people are going to react in this case. I think we got to wait and see the reaction. Okay, just saying apologies, my, my camera died on me, but I'm, I'm still here. Okay, right. so you talked about the, the sweet spot, um, 68 to 74 is what your pin tweet is. How, 
how active will we see OPEC over these next few months? I mean, should we expect some potential big moves? If you start to see this 50 million, uh, 50 million barrel draw, will we see OPEC well, make some big moves or are they kind of stuck with where they're at? Uh, I'm going to say a statement with, with caveats. Uh, if you, they are going to be very active and they have that meeting on the 1st of July and they are going to be active in terms of responding to it by increasing production. Uh, increasing production benefits them in several ways uh, in this case. Uh, and for uh, a country like Saudi Arabia, they really need to test uh, their new capacity and they need to test all the modifications they made to the areas that were hit in September, 2019. So they need to work on some kind of major increase in capacity, just like they, they did in uh, April, 2020. Uh, at the same time, at those prices, they generate good income to take and invest somewhere else. Uh, so the idea that they're going to be proactive and they are going to increase production is there. The caveat is we already learned from 2015, we already learned from uh, the fourth quarter of 2018, and we already learned from what happened in March that those surprises happen. Mm -hmm. And yes, while we are looking for a steady policy on uh, to keep prices where they are uh, now, uh, the idea that someone might crash the market again is still there and no one can deny that. And I think several uh, board members of various oil companies are keeping that in mind when they make their uh, investment decisions. Okay. We are now going to move to, we'll call it a rapid fire, just kind of a quick these are from Twitter, so just a quick answer. You don't have to expand too much, um, but we did ask people on Twitter uh, for questions that they would love to ask the doctor. I'm a fortunate enough to get to ask them, so we will ask that. So the first one is, it's a moon or a, it's a gray smiley face. So I guess they're thinking, do you think the price is gonna go up or do you think the price is not gonna go up? So this year, uh, on your June 25th, all the caveats in the world, these are just rapid fire. We won't hold your feet to the fire on these, but what do you think? Price is gonna go up next year or will it stay where it's at or go down? Uh, let me put it this way. <laughs> it's a, it's and, a rapid and, fire. No, no, I know, I know. The, the, the guy who asked the question, he knows exactly what I'm going to say. So that's why. <laughs> okay. An economist have always two opposing answers mm -hmm. for any question. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And Anas Al Haji has three. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> Where do you find the price of crude oil after opening the movement of travel? So this would be, I guess, country to country, long international flights would return. You don't see a lot of jet fuel demand there yet. So any thoughts on that? Yes, uh, of course, as, as you all know, most of the demand in gasoline and diesel recovered, uh, but we still have not uh, seen recovery in uh, jet fuel. Uh, so once we see this free movement, the jet fuel recovery is going to happen. That's going to impact other fuels and the reason why because when refineries uh, refine the barrel of oil as you know they get all kind of products and when they were getting that jet fuel they did not have enough demand for it so the only way to get rid of it is to mix it with other fuels and therefore the supply of other fuels increased now with the increase in jet fuel we are going to go back to normal and all of a sudden we are going to see the supply of, of certain type of diesel, for example, or others or kerosene just decrease as a result uh, of that. So we are going to see a macro uh, change where the total demand is going to increase. And then within that demand, we are going to see changes in the products and how the mix is going to uh, take place after that. Okay. Um, what are your true estimates on what OPEC plus can put back on the market over a three to four month mm -hmm. time frame? I, I, okay. Okay. I already answered this question. I said four to five yeah. uh, earlier. Uh, uh, they, they can do that. But there is something else that we rarely talk about simply because um, it has uh, a value only during crisis. We have something called surge capacity. Uh, and with surge capacity under circumstances, they can go as high as they want, uh, but it won't last. This four five can last. Okay. 
How does the good doctor maintain his meme game? What's his secret and where does he stash his memes? This is a great question. I laugh pretty hard because I've wondered this myself. Um, okay, I'm going to make a confession here. <laughs> uh, uh, very few people know this, uh, but some, uh, some people basically already seen my woodwork. I shared pictures of my woodwork on uh, Twitter. Uh, well, in my previous life, I did some graphic design. Mm. So that's the confession. So that's your confession. <laughs> I thought we were going to get more. Okay, that's your confession. Okay. How successful is green hydrogen in the world, especially in Saudi Arabia? And does it will it have any impact on oil production? Um, regardless of Saudi Arabia, let's talk about uh, hydrogen and green hydrogen in general. Um, I was among the first researchers to work on hydrogen and the impact of the of hydrogen and fuel cells on the oil industry in uh, in the 90s and uh, I have a long story with uh, Saudi Aramco because of that I'm not going to mention it but uh, um, uh, everyone was interested at that time but when Bush comes to shove no one is interested that's the bottom line of the more experience hype, more hype than more hype than reality Okay, so at that time, when we did the work, it was very clear that if we go theoretically with what's going on, hydrogen is going to have a, a, an impact on the oil industry. Now, electric vehicles basically are taking exactly the same impact that we foresaw in the 90s. So what we foresaw earlier with hydrogen now is happening with electric vehicles. Now, to go with the green hydrogen, the only way it works, if we utilize uh, the wind industry and solar at times where there is no demand, which means that we either have negative prices or zero cost or near zero cost. At that time, green hydrogen makes sense. The problem is green hydrogen production becomes intermittent, just like wind and solar, mm -hmm. which is a problem that we are always complaining about. Right. The reply to that is, which is a valid reply, is, look, don't look at green hydrogen as a solution or a big solution. Look at green hydro uh, hydrogen as a battery that can store energy. And to me, that makes perfect sense because you are taking electricity that is wasted from wind and solar. And instead of building batteries that cost a lot of money and end up with a lot of waste and some of it basically is uh, uh, poisonous, etc., uh, and toxic, uh, what you can do basically is convert that to hydrogen and you can store that hydrogen for a very long time and use it anywhere you want to. You can ship it anywhere and use it. That makes perfect sense. If we use it as a storage okay. of energy, that makes perfect sense. And we should not look at it, uh, at it as the future solution for uh, energy in this case. So in a sense, it is a solution for renewable energy to store energy when we don't need that energy. Okay. Um, why, let's see, this is uh, it's kind of a weird question here. Why is Ryan Ray smarter than me? And will you take me as his, as your apprentice? That's from a guy named Big Oren. I don't know. Do you? I don't know that guy, but that's that was his question. The, that's kind of a, a very strange name. Who is that? <laughs> it's some some very small Twitter guy. That's a that's pretty pretty irrelevant person, as best I can tell. So, <laughs> <laughs> this well, Big Oren, uh, you had your uh, you had your chance. You had your chance. <laughs> absolutely. I I I, I seriously. Look, uh, Big Oren, um, uh, you are a great friend, and uh, the people really need to hear your thoughts. I think one of the smartest and one of the best researchers I've seen in the market, and you should join us. As I mentioned on Twitter, uh, we are not going to reveal your name. We no. can change your voice, and, and you'll stay anonymous, and, and people can benefit from your contribution. Yeah. And then the last thing I'll, I'll leave with Anas is I was on a show yesterday. Uh, I think it was on a show. Anyways, someone brought up your um, your story about writing, 
about having the baby. And so for folks who missed it, the last time Anas was on told this fantastic story about the writing process and having a baby. So go back and listen to the podcast just for that, because people still bring that to my attention to this day. It was so true, so funny. And when someone gets involved with the writing process, I always send them that clip like, hey, go watch this because I get frustrated. I'm like, go watch this. And then they're all like, that's, 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 that's it. That's perfect. So Anas- I, I have one comment on that. This go is ahead. a new comment. Okay. The problem is, imagine sometimes I'm explaining this to people and I have, let's say, 40 people in the room. And there is this young woman who is 18 years old and she's looking at me like, what is this weirdo talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea here is, uh, unless people who know these things don't say it in front of them. <laughs> Well, I have a wife and four kids, and so I, I can't testify to the process uh, as far as experiencing it, but I've been there four times for it, So, uh, and it is, uh, it's, it's 100% accurate, so I'll, I'll just say that. So anyways, Anas, um, people should go and follow you, of course, on Twitter, where you have a huge, huge following. It's um, at Anas Alahaji. Is there anywhere, or uh, you, you also have your website? Well, uh, my uh, it's my website with the same name, but I would like to encourage people to use Google Google translation. I put I post yes. a lot of things in Arabic. Mm -hmm. All they got to do just translate whether the tweet or translate the things. I uh, I am the editorial advisor of Aptaha, which is the uh, the first and the only uh, um, energy platform in Arabic, mm -hmm. and that platform basically produces some. Uh, really original stories and some breaking news. Uh, we have, uh, even recently, we have several pieces of breaking news. Uh, uh, Waiters and Bloomberg, et cetera, reported that a day or two days later. Oh, wow. So if you want to get this news before others, all you get to do, just hit that translate button on uh, Twitter. And how, how and accurate is that. it? But is it pretty, pretty, pretty reliable? Um, I can tell you, I, for the last two years, the improvement is amazing. Okay. I mean, you still have those glitches where things sure. get really sure. funny, uh, yeah. but uh, uh, generally speaking, it's amazing. Okay, well, Anas, that is, and we'll so we'll link to their uh, Twitter profile, which is A T T A Q A two um, on Twitter. So we'll link to that as well, uh, and then you can check out their website. Anas is uh, good to have you on. Uh, All right, we'll thank on you again in the future. Thank you, sir, and we'll talk soon.